Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of the Making of Podcast. I am so excited, guys. I've been looking forward to this particular conversation for many weeks, ever since I attended their um, their course in North Carolina. And you guys are in for a treat. I have the one, the only Dr. Rob Ritter of Ritter and Ramsey. He is half of the duo today. But you guys, we are going to talk about so many things that I am so passionate about. We're going to be talking about branding, marketing, setting yourself um, apart from the competition, case acceptance, psychology, oh my gosh, treatment planning, the whole nine. And before I hit record, I actually got on with, um, with Rob and I said, you know, I could listen to you guys talk for days. Like I did not want that course to end. By far, guys, I have taken so many CE courses. I've taken AACD. I've taken anything cosmetic. I've taken COIS. And it this course was exactly what I was looking for. It was exactly that I was craving because we learn all the technical stuff but we don't necessarily know how to implement that back into our practices. And if you don't know how to communicate, communication is the number one thing that you must really try to perfect and always keep getting better. And Dr. Ritter and Dr. Ramsey, you guys are masters at communication. And I've spoken already so much. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rob. It's so nice to have you here. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, Ashley. And it was so great to have you at um, at our course in, in North Carolina. And God, I mean, your introduction was everything I wanted to say about my course. I don't have to say anything else. <laughs> you, know, you did a masterful job explaining what we do and, and how we do it. So thank you so much for the opportunity to spend some time with you and your your wonderful uh, group of people that you've you've built over the last couple of years. It's It's very impressive. Well, thank you so much. I I heard about the protocol. Um, I think I heard about it for the first time last year. I attended a Seattle study club symposium and your, your BFF, Bob Marges, he was talking about, about how you do dentistry and, and how you communicate with your patients and how his practice is so different from Ritter and Ramsey. And I was like, I wonder what that's like. And then I I, um, I got stuck in my bubble of practicing. And then this year I had already packed the year full of so many courses. And one of my, one of my friends said, I am taking the protocol in, um, in April and I'd love for you to take it with me. We, we like to take classes together. And I said, you know, I'm already at Spear. I can't, I can't change this. And I can't add something else to the things that I'm already doing because I'm opening my second location. And she said, okay, fine. But one of your attendees who it, I absolutely adore, she messaged me and she said, I don't know if you've heard about the protocol, but I am a raving fan. I'm like a Jehovah's Witness. I will tell everybody and their mom about the protocol. Ashley, you have to go. Like, you have to go and then tell me what you think. And I said, Allison, okay. And Allison and, Allison and I have been friends on social media for many years. And um, she's been following the podcast for uh, a while. And I said, you know what, Allison, if you have listened to me rant about so many things in my practice, about the things that are going right and the things that are going not so right, um, I will take your word for it. So I went down my rabbit hole of listening to all, I think I've listened to every single interview you have done on every podcast there was. And after, <laughs> after the first, second, third podcast, I reached out to you directly on Instagram and I said, um, I would love to take your course. I've been down a rabbit hole. Just teach me. I want, I want to be um, your grasshopper. <laughs> so, um, and um, I know I'm talking a lot because I'm so passionate about what you and Chris have, have like brought together. Do you mind for anybody who is not familiar with Ritter, Ritter and Ramsey, 
Will you tell everyone who you are, where you practice, and how it all got started? Wow. Well, well again, what an introduction. And there's so much to unpack from just what, what you just said. <laughs> so, And I wrote a few things down, so I, I don't forget. So I'll start off with me and Chris, the practice, the protocol, and then mention a couple of things as we go. Um, and if, you know, I'll try to do it for brevity's sake. If anything, please stop me and, and we'll expand on that. Okay. Um, so the practice, uh, we've been working together for 20 years. We've been in our space for this July will be 19. And uh, we've, I, he was my associate for four years before he became my partner. So we're 50-50 partners in the practice, 50-50 partners in the, in the real estate. And um, the, the synthesis of where we came from was I bought a practice 20, let's see, add another seven on top of that. So 26 years ago, and I was an associate in there for two years before. He became my associate and said, we have to move. We have to own our own space. We can't rent space from this gentleman. So we moved the practice. And, you know, like every other practice, it's gone through its changes and metamorphosized through the years. Um, times we were fee-for-service, times we were PPO, times where, you know, right now we're 100% we're fee-for-service. And so along the way, you know, I was lecturing. I've been lecturing since 1990. I think my first lecture was 1997. Chris came out and started lecturing as well. So we've lectured both nationally and internationally. We've spoken for Seattle study clubs. We've spoken in many different countries across the planet. He's been to Japan. We've been to, you know, Australia, New Zealand, been to Europe. It's just been, it's been Canada, Mexico, that sort of thing. It's been quite a trip, you know, it's, it's been a, a quite a journey. Um, and what happened, I'll give you the, uh, the, the genesis of the, of the protocol is obviously COVID uh, changed everything. And when we basically got grounded from lecturing, you couldn't lecture anymore. I finally threw in the towel and I said, I'm done. I told my business partner, I'm done. I, I'm not going on the road anymore. I just, I've done it for 25 years. I'm I'm done. Um, not because I don't like the people when I'm there. It's, it's a great thing when you're in study clubs and speaking at big meetings, it, like, you know, this weekend, you know, there's a couple of big meetings going on and it's great to be there with your friends and colleagues and share information learn from the best. But the the daily grind of, of working and then running to the airport to go fly out, and it's not easy to get in and out of where I live. Um, I just said, I'm done. I said, but I don't want to, I don't want to quit teaching. I, I, I enjoy sharing. So what am I going to do? And so when they finally let us walk again on the beach, which was one of the most ridiculous things they, you know, they, they wouldn't let you uh, do things during COVID, which now look back, you, you were like, none of that made sense. I was walking along the beach one day and called up my other friend and told them the exact same story. And I said, I just want to come up with this program that we can do here. People can come here. I can treat them the way I want to be treated myself. I said, just that we do these things in a workflow. And we have these certain protocols that we've established through the years that we follow that get us the ultimate success. He goes, stop right there. He goes, that's the name of your program. And I said, what's that? He goes, you didn't, you didn't even listen to yourself. You're talking so much, you didn't listen to yourself. <laughs> What's that? He says, the protocol. You have a protocol for doing things. Hence, that's where the name came from. Told my business partner what we're going to do. He said, sure. <laughs> but he didn't mean that in a positive way. He meant it like, let's see what happens. And when I put it out there on Instagram, within 24 hours, we sold out our first course. So we were, we were on to something which was really, really great. Um, the two-day course we do here. Obviously, you came to North Carolina. We decided to move it just to see what it would be like in a different facility doing it, that wonderful experience center up for a line and it really lent itself very well towards it, right? Um, we had a great time and I think the people that were there really enjoyed it and we enjoyed giving it. It's two days of patient acquisition, patient communication, practice life, practice skills, practice. Uh, I would say the, the thing that we do is I think we cut out a lot of the chaff and get down to the wheat, if yes. you want to call it that. Yes. And and that's because, you know, it's a two-day program. So let me, let me all, I always make this statement and it sounds redundant at this point, but I want to make sure your audience understands this. This course, the protocol is not a replacement for going through the COIS curriculum mm -hmm. or going through SPEAR education or going through the Dawson Academy. It is not that. Those are wonderful foundational places that I've gone in both my partner. I've done all of Dawson. I've done all of Spear. I've done all of Coise. My partner did all of uh, uh, Spear and all of Coise, and he also did all of Panky. And so we bring all this wonderful knowledge together, but we noticed 
all the time as people go through these programs, they go back to their practice and they can't practice what they've been taught. Right. They can't implement it. They don't know how to speak to their team members. They don't know how to speak to their, to their patients. They don't know how to communicate with their specialists. And then they wind up with this incredible knowledge and wonderful amount of frustration because they know what the right thing is to do, but they can't get it across to their clientele to move it forward. And so I said, that's the missing part here. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's put that together. Let's package that together and give that to people. I don't want to call it in a cookbook. We're giving you everything, right? I mean, so, you know, Joyce, Joyce, Mm -hmm. the dentist. Yes. And Joyce, I think I said this during the course, and I remember I'm a, I'm a little older now, is she says, you know what's great about those guys is that there's no gatekeeping. And I never heard that until Joyce last year. I said, can you please elaborate on that? She says, yeah, you don't hide anything. There's no, you know, well, if you listen to this, then you can take this next from me. And then maybe in the third course from me, you can, whatever we have, we give to you. There's no holding anything back. And so they seem to really enjoy that aspect of it. Let me put it back to you. Did you think that we gatekeeped anything or did we share everything we possibly could, Ashley? No, you guys absolutely shared everything. And that's why I could have listened like for, if if you had a week long course and just dialed in exactly how you do certain things in your office, um, I I would gladly attend that course. And I, I want to point out, so- you had mentioned that the class is typically done in your office in Florida. I did love, I mean, don't get me wrong. I absolutely loved going to the Align, the Experience Center. It was amazing. But a part of me wishes like, man, if I could just go back to your your home base and walk through the exact experience, walk through how the patient filters through your office from the phone call to the moment they leave. I would have loved that as well. Maybe that should be 2.0. Could be, or (laughs) 2.0 being something a little else. I mean, we were talking about that before and I've got some ideas for 2.0. And we we, we have heard that over and over again, Ashley. So we are going to go back and do it in our practice. Okay. And we've got two dates set up for the rest of the year. We've got one for August 25th and 26th. Nice. And one for November 10th and 11th, which is where we've always done it. And it seems to be that's where people really want to come. They want to see us operate in our own facility. We wanted to give the Experience Center a try just because there was so much more room that, you know, the limiting factor we have, let's just say what it really comes down to is I can have 16 people in our course. That's not really a lot of people when you have a course. Now, the advantage to that is because it's so small. And I love small group learning. You get all your questions answered. It's a different experience, right? It's total camaraderie instead of sitting in a room of 400 people, which is great for what that is. It's just not the same exchange, right? It's not the same energy exchange. Um, you, It's almost like a big wedding then versus a small dinner party, right? That's how I kind of look at things. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we're going to go back to doing it in our practice. And of course, you know, we get to do things in our practice And for let's say food, for example, I mean, the food was very good up at the Experience Center. I I really liked it up there. It's not where I go for breakfast or lunch or dinner, like back home, which we would do when you come to our our office. So we're going to move it back there. And um, but we wanted to see a proof of concept, too, if it could be taken on the road. And and, and it was I think it was successful. Uh, We're just going to go back to do it in our practice now. But, But again, the problem with that becomes. You want to come, you got to sign up quick because the seats go very, very quickly. And what we have noticed is that people travel with friends. So you came with Minhi and with um, uh, Kim and Tim. Yep. Yeah, the, the four of you came. Yes. And so what we have noticed is people come in groups of two, three, four. And the problem becomes if you wait, and I only have two seats left and there's four of you. I, I, we can't, I mean, we literally can't make it happen. I don't have the physical room. So that's why I always tell people and they think it's a marketing ploy. It's really not. It's if you want to come and you want to come with friends, you got to come, you got to sign up early because then there's just a couple of seats trickling off and, and that's it. I, I can't, I can't hold seats because they do go fairly quickly. 
which is, you know, a good and bad problem to have. I mean, it's just, it's what it is. And this is our third year. I mean, we're coming up to the end of the third year already. So it's working and it's working well, and it's a lot of fun. And I love sharing all this information with people because they're hungry. You know, you want to do well, you want to provide great dentistry. You, you want to enjoy your profession at the highest level possible. And, um, I think that's what we've tried to put together. In fact, I know that's what we've put together for you, right? I'm sure you've took back a lot of information to try to modify and make things work. You never want to follow everything somebody says. You want to pick and choose the things that feel right for you. Mm -hmm. um, but we've heard great success stories after you go back and implement some of the material that we've given to you. How's it been for you so far? Uh, well, I want... I save this just for the podcast instead of just texting you at uh, the moment it happened. But the cool. literally the day that I got back, I had two consultations where uh, there's, they're both cosmetic consultations. And typically I would just dial in what the patient wants and say, you know, okay, fine. We, we can make that happen. And Instead of doing that, instead of catering to what they believe they wanted, I took exactly the philosophies that you and Chris were speaking of, which is your, your motto, no compromise. And I told them exactly what it was. Like, this is what it is, and we're not going to compromise. If you want the smile where I, I know you are thinking you want, then we are not going to cut corners. And I sold two cases that were oh. triple the cost of what I would have like let them dictate. And I owe that to you guys. So um, yeah, I mean, the course has already paid for itself. Here um, we go. We got, yeah, there you go. And so let's dial in because your motto is no compromise. And I love what you you guys teach. And it's it's about mindset the young dentist right now is we feel like we are at the mercy of student loans at the mercy of PPO offices. We are bending over oh, at the mercy of um, social media review sites, the awful Yelp. Um, I know you're not privy to Yelp, but there are a lot of dentists who are, and we are thinking like, Oh my gosh, if we say no, if we don't do exactly what this patient is wanting, we're going to get blasted on, on social media and all of these, these sites. But you guys are like, you know what? There is a line in the sand and the easiest word in the English language is no. Can you elaborate on how, how you guys um, started drawing that boundary for yourselves and how early on in your practice did you start implementing that philosophy? Yeah, this is a great question. So let's take a little bit at a time, right? Um, if I, I would be lying to you if I told you that's what I was doing the moment I bought my practice. The answer is no. I did what the patient asked me to do to make them happy, right? And that's what we, I don't know if we were learned that, I, I don't know if we learned that in dental school. I don't know if the, I don't know where that comes from, but we do that, right? And I think in a sense, um, in dentistry, we're trying to make people feel better. I mean, remember, dentistry is transitioning a little bit too from, from wants-based dentistry to needs-based dentistry. So people coming in with a broken tooth or in pain, obviously you want to get them out of pain. That's what we are. We're healers, right? We're, we're, that's what we do. Um, at a certain point, though, the requests from the patients begin to go sideways. It's either they have too little information, haven't been to the dentist much, or now they're experts on Google and think they know everything, which is not a replacement for your degree. And what they want from you is either, either not really in their best interest long-term, which they don't know, or not clinically feasible for you to be able to actually do on that patient. So at a certain point, you have to decide for yourself, and I don't make this distinction for anybody, you know, I would say when you have an ability to give people choices, then you should give them choices. And Chris goes through this very, very well that you normally want to break things down into three. And the three things that you give them, if there are three different choices or opportunities, you always leave the best one last. for last. 
Correct. So if somebody comes in with the broken tooth and they're going to lose the tooth, and let's just use an example of this, right? Let's say they're going to lose tooth number 19. I love 19 because I'm left-handed. It's easy to work on. Okay. <laughs> Everybody has their own favorite tooth, don't they, Ashley? They do. So, they do. So, okay, now at this point, they're going to have to have the tooth extracted. It's not savable. If it needs two, two procedures, let's say they need crown lengthening and an endodontic procedure, then it gets a crown. It becomes an extraction at that point because the cost differential just doesn't make any sense. Plus, you're losing healthy bone. That's the way we kind of look at things. Okay, so now what are you going to do? If the patient needs the tooth extracted, what are your options there? So let's give them three options and three options only. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the worst option to me is take the tooth out and do nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. Because yeah. then what's going to, we know what's going to happen. Number 14 is going to super up down into the space of number 19. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not a great option. That's the, the worst you give first option two. What's the second worst choice in my over the years for the most of the time, it would be a three and a bridge especially if it was a virgin 18 and a virgin 20, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Because you're, take, you're taking a one tooth problem and turning it into a three tooth problem. Okay. So you give that as a second option. What's the third best option? Single implant. Single implant. Keeps a one tooth problem, a one tooth problem, right? We know that they're never going to get decay around the restoration, right? They're never going to get an abscess after there's initial stability, primary stability of placing the implant, then osseointegration a couple of months later. So what's going to be your mode of failure? Typically with an implant crown restoration used to be cement over crowns. Now we do scrementable on the posterior. Could the screw get loose? Potentially, yes. If we're doing full zirconia on top, chances of the zirconia breaking are very low. Actually, what I'm seeing now more than anything else is just movement. Teeth mm -hmm. move, mm -hmm. contacts open up. We've noticed that now especially on the, the, the uh, you know, mesial or distal of the tooth. But, you know, that's a solvable problem. 10 plus years down the road, you unscrew the crown, take a new impression and make a new crown using the same abutment. So there's solutions, but they're not, they're not detrimental. They're not long-term negative. So of the three options, what's the last option? The implant, that's the one you give last. So that's what we started to do. And all of a sudden, when we started doing it that way, our case acceptance shot up through the roof, right? The patient satisfaction went up. Longevity of restorations went up. And we enjoyed doing what we were doing better. Now, let me go back. Um, you mentioned my friend Bob Marger, just a very good friend of mine, texted him. We spoke this morning very briefly. Bob and me have very different practices, as he's told you, right? Bob is, and this is, these are, I'm trying to give facts now. I'm not giving opinions. Bob has a very successful PPO practice. He does incredibly well. He's a very skilled dentist. He's mm -hmm. also very fast. So under those constraints, he can do very good dentistry. In fact, what I've told Bob through the years, and I've known Bob over 20 years, is your patients, whether they know it or not, are spoiled. Mm -hmm. They're spoiled. They're spoiled beyond belief because they're getting excellent quality dentistry at written off fees. I mean, those people are not paying what they really should be paying for that dentistry. They're just not. But I also decided, you know, years ago, I, I can't practice like that. I don't enjoy running three rooms of restorative dentistry. Um, and I don't want to ever walk in a room now where I, you go over the tickle sheet or the green sheet or the new patient sheet, whatever you want to call it. And you ask the patient, how did you find us? My insurance told me to come here. Mm. I used to, you know, cringe like I was drinking pickle juice when I heard that. Uh. <laughs> you know, you're not coming to me because we're the best perceived best in town. You're not coming to me because my team members treat you the best. You're not coming to me because we have the nicest office or the best reputation. You're coming because your insurance told you to come here. I, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. I, I just, I couldn't do it. Now, that's not for everybody. Some people don't mind that at all. There's a dentist south of me, sees 100 patients a day. He doesn't care, and he's very successful. I think it's great. That's why I never belittle anybody else of running a practice the way that they are happy running the practice. It's one of the best things about our profession, right, Ashley? You get Absolutely. to work as many days as you want, whatever hours that you want, take off whatever time that you want. I mean, it's the greatest thing.
you're your own boss. You're your own CEO. Um, so I never belittle anybody that wants to practice different than me. My thing has always been, I'm trying to always add value and trying to add be best practices to our office. That's what I'm always looking for. And so, you know, learning all of these different modalities, whether it be through Seattle Study Club, a very, you know, an excellent organization or these academies I'm a part of, or taking these continuums, just adding layer upon layer to build the best patient experience possible is where all of this came from. Did I answer the question? Yes, yes. absolutely. So when you first started though, you didn't, yes. you were still in network and you were still- well, no, no, When I first started the practice, no, the practice was a fee-for-service practice oh. up until 2008 when the world changed, when the banks crashed, we went into the recession and um, I, I noticed that there were changes in the practice. So we decided to take on PPOs just to have people still coming in and pay the bills. Gotcha. Now, my mistake, my mistake was we kept them for too long mm. and that's all. However, COVID gave me the greatest reset in my practice and in my professional speaking career. Two things happened. First thing, obviously, I came up with the protocol, switched mm -hmm. going out on the road. Now, I'll still do some lectures. I'm speaking twice this year at some big meetings. I'm doing the um, the Glidewell I.O. meeting out oh. in uh, Port Beach. I'm speaking there, and so is Chris in August. And I'm speaking at the ASDA meeting, American Society for Dental Aesthetics, over in Sarasota in November. So I will do some big meetings, uh, which is great. But the typical one-offs, unless you know, I know these people and I'm friends with them, and I've some, two people ask me at the Restorative Academy, would you come to my club? Of course, I've known them for 25 years, but typically I, I just, I, I can't, you don't understand the anxiety I get of going to the airport and, mm -hmm. and, and you've seen what's happening with flights. It's just not, um, for the business traveler, it's not what it used to be. Let's, let's leave it at that. The second thing was when we transitioned out of the PPOs, it was during COVID. And I thought it was the per cover or camouflage for doing it. Think about what happened since COVID. Practices closed down mandatory from the federal government. Then it became a state issue. I'm not going to get into the politics of this. What happened though? Hyperinflation. Everything in your life became hyperinflated. I the small, I can give example after example after example. For my protein powder that I buy for my morning shakes, that went from $40 to $84. Almost everything doubled. A couple of weeks ago, eggs went to $9 a dozen. Milk went to what? $8 a gallon. Um, your, insur your insurance went up. Your, your home insurance went up, especially here in Florida. Gas went up. I mean, we just name it. Absolutely name it. So I said, you know what? What a great time for us to get out of the PPOs. These people are used to paying more now for everything. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, they're going to be used to paying more money. We have lost less than maybe 3% when we transitioned out of the PPOs. But there was a way to do this correctly. Let me also give a shout out to some other people, if that's okay, Ashley. Absolutely. Do you know who Vivek is? He runs... Um, he, I uh, do know him very well. He's actually a uh, a sponsor for our group and the retreat. Excellent. He's right. So I know, I, I know, you know, through the years, I know a lot of people now. Paul Goodman, Vivek. I know, you know, Craig Spodak and 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 Pete Bolden from Bulletproof. I can go on and on. And Amanda and Adama. I just go. You know, these are friends of mine. And so Paul put me in touch with Vivek, and he spent two hours on the phone with me, and he basically gave me the blueprint of what we're going to do. And he gave me two options. He gave me options, like, right? He gave me a couple of different options. He gave me two quick options or a third option. And after speaking to him, I went back and kind of wrote down what I'm going to do and whiteboarded it out. And I said, we're going to get rid of the PPOs. We're going to do it systematically, not all at once. We're not going to send a letter out to our patients. We're not going to drop them cold turkey. We're still going to provide care for these patients. The key is going to be how we communicate with our patients when they make their next appointment. And if you do it the way that he told you to do it, we lost. I, I asked my office manager this, Kathy, who you met. I said, Kathy, I want you to think about the last two years. How many patients do you think transferred out of the practice? She said, I think 
maybe not even 20 or 25 people out of a practice that is 4,500 patients. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Now, let me say this. I don't want to take credit for this. I came up with the idea. I spoke to the right people. It was my team that implemented the strategy to not lose the patient, right? And now here's the best part. Now that we're out for two years, the new patients coming in, that's all they know. Right. That's all that's the way that we're doing it right now. So they're paying, you know, full fee for, for everything. And again, it's not actually another line. I think we said this at the protocol. It's not what people tell you. It's what they don't tell you. Mm. Correct. Yes. Um, we still file the insurance. We still collect the insurance payment. We don't what, so what I, I, I want to use this distinction as well, co comparing PPO to fee for service. I'm not really liking fee for service because I'm not sure that when I use, I mean, when I say that, I mean the term fee for service. Fee for service to me, the true fee for service means that let's say you did a crown for $1,500. You collect all $1,500 from the patient. You file the insurance and then the insurance payment goes to the patient. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't have that practice. We fill out the paperwork. We estimate how much based on other people within that insurance usually pay. We collect that from the patient. And then we wait for the residual to come from the insurance company and make up the difference. What do you call that, Ashley? Let me throw it back to you because I've spoken a lot for the last couple of minutes. I call that an out-of-network pr provider. Thank you. That's what we are. We're an out-of-network provider. So let's use the correct terms. So I don't like when people say, Ritter, your fee for service on PPO. No, no, no. I'm out-of-network provider because we still accept insurance. And by the way, 50% of our patients have insurance, 50. So again, it's not what they tell you, so they don't tell you. Years ago, Ashley, I'm telling you the why I say this. Um, this dentist used to speak a lot. And he had this practice within a practice mentality, still does, where he does general dentistry and did a lot of smile designs. I was blown away by the amount of smile designs he was doing. I'm like, wow, it's incredible. And you're doing all this dentistry and he was doing CEREC and just a, a, an amazing machine, right? Until I find out he takes insurance. And the way he was speaking about it, you would swear if you take me out of the equation that he didn't accept insurance. And I said, wait a minute. You take you accept insurance? He says, Yeah, I'm a I'm a provider, PPO. So oh, you even take PPOs? He goes, Yeah. I go, you didn't say that. He goes, You didn't ask. <laughs> and I went, Oh, wow. Is that the world we live in? Yeah. See, that we won't do it. Let's go back to the protocol. Did we ever do that at the protocol? No. 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 I think your story of going back and utilizing the contextual information, the way we presented it, makes me so happy, Ashley. I, I have the smile on my face that goes down to my, my heart and my soul because that means that what we're sharing with you is legit and it works. Now, you sold two cases that you might not have. I'm, I don't want to put that out there, but you might have done it differently before. It paid for the course. You've got the knowledge moving forward now, which is going to change your trajectory. So I keep asking the same thing. How can you not come and take this course? I'm telling you. That's why I'm trying to get you guys over to Napa also. Mm. Get you out in front of, of our audience. I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. I'd love to meet your audience. I'm sure it's a great, great group. I mean, if it's... they're following you, you're so, you know, let me, let me try to find the right words here. You're easy to speak to. I can just tell you're a generous soul that wants to share and help people. And of course, there's a monetary gain at the end of it, but you can't tell. And that I always felt like if you always did the right thing, the money would follow anyway. But I think you're like the living, breathing embodiment of that. And I think you're helping out so many young dentists right now by doing this. The reason I listen to podcasts is I'm always trying to, I'm more of a student than ever before, but I love listening to what you're sharing with young dentists who need this because of everything that you said at the beginning of the conversation. Student loans, getting pushed by patients, just, you know, getting overwhelmed by Instagram dentistry, um, everything from that. 
And so for you to provide the service for people, and I, there's so many people out there doing a great job. You, Mark Costas is helping people get their numbers straight, right? Pete and Craig doing a great job getting people to understand the business of dentistry, right? They do a great job. Amanda and Adamo teaching skills that you need in your practice for the rest of your career. It's so different than when I started. It's so much better. Mm -hmm. Well, that means so much to me. Thank you. I appreciate that. And th seriously, I, um, everything that I do for this audience, for the startup group, it's, it's all from a place of like, let's elevate the profession. Let's, let's not make us so, um, so fee like fear-based even doing a startup everybody's like why are you doing a startup it's so saturated and that's one thing that I have absolutely loved about the course I mean there's so many things that I loved but you guys are so clear on who you are and I oh, that's like the perfect segue let's talk about brand Let's talk about brand and differentiation. And you guys spent the good, like what, first half of the course just on, on how your branding is not just the dentistry that you're doing. It's everything. Do you, do you want to elaborate on that, Rob? Absolutely. I think that's a great segue into it and, and what we do. Um, it is all based on brand, isn't it? I mean, within the first hour, we're talking about branding yourself. I, I believe now more than ever before that coming up with your own brand, being true to yourself, being authentic, I use the words authentic, genuine, um, built based around, based around brand is because that's how you're going to differentiate yourself from the other dentists in town. Let's not kid ourselves. Wherever we are, there are other dentists in town. Across the street from me, Ashley, are five dentists in one building. I think I, I, think I said this, and if I didn't, I've never met any of them. Mm -hmm. I've been there 18 years. I haven't, I couldn't tell you what any of them look like in the face. Hmm. We have great camaraderie in our town. There is no dental society. Those things are, if you do have that in your towns, I think it's wonderful. We don't have that. And so I don't really know what other people are doing. You know, people, you, you know, dentists used to get together and, and, and share in their communities. That doesn't really happen as much anymore. You have to go outside of that. Hence your Facebook group, which is a great learning environment and sharing environment. And so the first thing is you have to be true to yourself. Do what you want to do. If there's something that you don't want to do, don't do it. I mean, <laughs> why do we even have to be told that? Now, of course, starting out, you have to do things that you don't want to do because, like you said, you come out of school with a half a million dollars of debt. You have student loan payments, car payments. You want to eat, <laughs> right? You have your cell phone. I get it. At a certain point, though, you get the ball rolling. And when you get really unconsciously competent about doing something really well, then you start limiting your practice to those things or taking on all these new subsets of procedures that you get really good at. So you can expand your practice, not even shrink it down. I think it's even more important to expand your practice and offer more services than ever before. And again, a lot of opportunity out there. I could start naming people and what they teach. There are so many great places to go to learn how to place your own implants, to learn how to do direct composite veneers, to learn how to do all on four hybrids. Um, I could go on and on and on and on. So that is out there like never before. You add those skill sets, you start producing that type of dentistry in your practice, then you get out of your community and you make sure people know who you are. You're doing it, I call it integrity marketing, right? I'm not talking about something cheesy that you'd be embarrassed about later on. Something that looks back when you're able to look back on it and say, yeah, we built a foundation and now we're expanding from that. So many people I know have done that and they've done a great job of it. What is your brand? Your brand is just not the way you look or the way your office looks. It's the way you answer your phone. You Did you call my office, Ashley, and speak to our Ashley? I did. I did. did she she is so sweet. She's amazing on the phone. And what she say to you when they first pick up the phone? Uh, I think it's different when I called from uh, looking for the course. For the course. Okay. So yeah. if you call my office, it's the same line for the last 18 years. Good morning. It's an outstanding day at Ritter and Ramsey. I'm Ashley and I can help you. I love it. And why do we do that? 
Well, we're starting the whole acquisition process on a positive note. Because mm -hmm. typically people are calling up your practice hot, mm -hmm. right? Either they're in pain, something broke, something failed. It's an annoyance to them that they actually have to come to the dental office. Most of the time, you know, people come for potentially a negative reason. Half the time they want to come in and they want to improve themselves either by something as a, a prophy, a cleaning, or maybe do something like improving their smile. But the branding starts the moment they start looking for you online or asking a friend, who do you go see? And we go over this, right? Because if they ask a friend, who do you go see? Oh, we go see Ritter Ramsey. They're the best in town. They're typically not just going to pick up the phone and call. They're going to go to Google and search. They're going to look at your reviews, whether it be on Yelp or Google. They're going to go to your website. They're going to look at the, the, the office. They're going to look at the cases. They're going to look at the dentistry. They're going to look at your team members. They're going to look at your, you want to call it your accolades or what you're known for. And then all of that is going to help form an opinion that's based upon your brand. Then that moment when they actually call your office, the person who is answering that phone as the first point of contact is everything. Mm -hmm. And typically what Chris talks about is when you go to a restaurant, who do they typically put at the front of the restaurant who answers the phone or who seats you? It's the lowest paid employee, correct? Yes. Which is the worst thing you can possibly do. You need a highly skilled, highly trained, affable, what I call a marshmallow soaked in honey personality to be able to greet patients both in person and on the phone. And all of a sudden, it ties everything together from that moment going forward. That's what your brand is. And if you don't have a brand, your brand, let's say, remember this, is not a logo. It's not an icon. All that is is a symbol that does not tell people what your brand is. You must build a brand. You build an incredible brand. You've mm -hmm. already built a brand, right? Both for your practice and your online on your Facebook group, right? You have. And so you've done it the right way. Did it happen overnight, Ashley? No. How long did it take you to acquire and build out your brand, would you say? I'm still building out my brand. Another thought. Thank you. That's what I wanted you to say. <laughs> You're constantly changing things, modifying things, building and adding to your brand, right? It's a journey, not a destination. A hundred percent. And I love that. You incorporated not just the brand in the protocol, but you brought in your website developer to talk mm -hmm. about the website and key aspects of what to look for. And this is how we built ours. And this is how it's performing. Like you guys were very tactical. You weren't just spewing philosophical things that we can listen to every podcast you said, no, these are the things that you must do Monday morning when you go back. You need to do X, Y, and Z, and you, you need to make sure that all of these um, I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. And that's why I took so many notes. I took, um, oh man, like just on your branding, I, I repeated it on my notepad. I said, it's not just the logo. It's how we answer the phone, how we enter you into the office, how we exit you out of the office, the interaction, the social media. It's the way the outside world perceives your practice, the act of shaping your unique, distinctive brand. And it's what um, it's all of these sets of creative elements that feed into your branding process, that broadcast your values, your purpose, and your message to your audience. Wow. Wow. I took notes. <laughs> You're an incredible student. You're an incredible student. That's what it's all about, right? That's where it builds from. And yeah, we all want to get there. We want to get there fast too. You know, did I say the line, everybody wants a shortcut to greatness? Did I oh, use that? First? Taking that right now. Okay. Everybody wants a shortcut, a shortcut to greatness, right, right, a shortcut right. to greatness, right? Everybody wants to have the $8 million practice with $2 million EBITDA and mm -hmm. uh, doing 10 smiles a month. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I get it. I understand it. Or you want to own the eight practices, you know, and be the CEO of the eight. Pra I understand that. I'm not saying you can't do it. You can 
It's just not going to happen overnight. It takes, you must be diligent at the same time, patient, know what the focus is going to be. Don't let anybody. And then the last thing is don't let anybody tell you not to do something, Ashley. Mm. Don't. Okay. I have come across in my career, uh, too many people who've said to me, you can't do this. You shouldn't do this. They're negative. They're defeatist. They're not really going to help you. And if I like to think that more people will help you than not, especially when you get around a certain circle of people like yourself and other people that we know. Somebody says, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. I don't buy that. I just, I, I don't buy that. Now, if you go there, you whatever that, that place is, and you realize it's not what you thought or you don't like it and you decide you don't want to do it, that's different. That's fine. You did the journey. You put the work in. It's not what you thought it would be. It's not giving you the joy, the happiness, the financial remuneration, whatever it is. At the end, you make the decision not to do it. When somebody tells you, oh, don't do that. It's not going to work. I don't care what they think. If I would have listened to these people in my career and listened to them of not doing the things that I did, I wouldn't be on this pod with you right now. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. So don't let anybody stop you from achieving whatever that goal is. And I don't know. Everybody's goal is different. Everybody's definition of success is going to be different. A hundred percent. I, 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 I want to be respectful of your time. And I know I could talk to you for hours, Rob. And it, can you believe it's already 11 or at, at my end? It's, it's already, right. it's, 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 it's already right. been an hour, almost an hour. Almost but an before hour. we, I know yeah. how did that, that like flew by. Be before we wrap though, can we just talk about, oh, gosh, since you brought up Ashley and you brought up Kathy and your amazing team, um, well, one, I, I think the team is a direct reflection of leadership and um, so much of, of what I've learned as a business owner has, I mean, I, I always thought that the first hire would retire with me. I was so like, this is, you know, I'm going to be the greatest boss. I'm going to do all the things. I'm not going to ruffle feathers. And at the end of the day, what weighed on me was the fact that I could not be honest and truthful with my communication. I, I love that part of your, uh, your message in the course was always be communicating, always mm -hmm. be communicating with the patients and with your team. Because when you, uh, there was a, a period of time where you guys introduced your team members and you had them stand up and they, they, they told everyone how long they've been in the practice. And they were like 14 years, 20, like it was so remarkable, the loyalty that you've built within your team. Can you tell us the process of what is the secret to attracting and maintaining those high performance team members? Uh, Ashley, I think it comes down to, I've always said, you take care of the patients, you take care of your team, they'll take care of you, they'll take care of your profits, right? Now, I've had many team members through the years, you know, these people have been with me a long time, Kathy, 23 years, Ashley, 15, Nan, you didn't meet, has been there for 14, our clinical partners, assistants have been there for 15 and 16 years. Um, I don't know. I just, I tend to think that they believe in what we do. I think more than anything else, right? They're committed people. They're not, they're not flighty people. These people believe in what they're doing and how we're doing it. Um, I will tell you, we've had team members who leave and go other places and the grass is not so green on the other side. And some of them come back and say, you spoiled us. <laughs> you know, these are people that move to other cities and other towns, other states, things like that. And they struggle because it's not done the way that we taught them how to do it from the ground up. Um, just be respectful of people, be respectful of their time, be respectful of their place. Um, but it's always at the same time, I don't even use the word, but I would say, and always remember it's a journey. It's a constant lifelong learning process. These people want to grow as well. And so providing that opportunity for them is really important. Um, you know, you know, when you stagnate as a person uh, and you're not growing, it's not fulfilling. It's not mm -hmm. joyful. And I'm really at the point where it's, if it's not joyful, I'm not going to do it anymore. 
uh, heard this from other people, and it really is more important now than ever before. We live in different times. It's very different practicing now than it was in the mid 1990s. It's a very different environment. So you have to have people who believe in what you believe in and doing it for the right reasons. And if you have that, um, you're going to have a firm foundation moving forward. People will come and go in life. That's There's nothing we can do about that. Um, you want to pick up the right people. And the right people always seem to step out in front and, and, and shine, right? I mean, we all have our superstars. And we have other people who are just there for a paycheck. But I've seen that through time, they typically wind up self-terminating because mm -hmm. they can't keep up the pace with everybody else, both physically or mentally, spiritually. Mm -hmm. And so, and that happens. And I think actually having flesh, fresh blood come into a practice sometimes to change up the chemistry is not a bad thing. Um, as long as you're hiring the right personality. And here's the thing, hire the personality, mm. hire the work ethic, don't hire the skill set. Right. Because the fact is skills can always be taught. Yes. You can always send them for skill training. You can always educate. We just hired a new assistant. She has no chair side as, uh, assisting skills, yet she has an incredible personality and an incredible, equally matched by her work ethic. And so we're going to train her up over the next year. And this is the kind of person that I can tell is going to be in the practice for the next 10 plus years, because you could see how she's thinking and asking the correct questions. And you could tell that she wants to be part of something bigger than herself. And this is going to be a career for her, not just a job. And I think if we, un we can understand that and we can help, I don't call sell that, but explain it to, pay to, to our team members then that always is a huge benefit to us and our patients moving forward. Um, Ashley, you know, it's been very easy to speak to you for an hour. I, I'm looking up at this too, and I'm thinking we're about five minutes away from an hour and it just flew Blue by. Pie. And mm -hmm. um, what you have done with your community is, is exceptional. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I see what people are doing right now. It's, it's pretty awe-inspiring what's happening in our profession. And so I never want to hear people are, it's not good to hear people are struggling. It doesn't make me feel good. Mm -hmm. Yet there are so many outlets for them to tap into to get help. And you're providing a major service for people. And um, you should be very proud of what you've done and how you're doing it. And uh, it was great spending time with you in Raleigh with your friends. You guys were so in the moment. And, um, you know, it's an energy exchange, right? So when you have people that are there that want to be there, and you could tell that they're focused and they're asking the good questions for us, the time goes by quickly. And it doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like we're teaching. I just feel like we're having a conversation is the way I like to look at what the protocol is. It's never pontificating down. It's not coming from a place of superiority. It's that people come to us with very specific issues, questions, concerns, wants, needs. And I think we fill that for them. And so Thanks so much for having me on your pod. And um, maybe you'll see me out at. Uh, you know. I, I will. Thank you so much, Rob. It really was an honor and such a pleasure to, to meet you in person and to have you here with us for an hour. And I wanted to say, guys, um, closing remarks. I don't even want it to be closing remarks. I want it to be opening remarks because I really want Dr. Doctors Ritter and Ramsey to be a bigger component of our group, our our retreat. And I don't know if you're up for this, Rob, but if there is a way um, to put an identifier, if you're listening to this, mark my words, like please, if if you if you are going to take any course this year or next year, make the protocol be it because I know that you said everybody wants the shortcut to greatness this is the shortcut oh. like, take take the course take the course and I really want you can you make like um like an identifier I get no kickbacks guys I get no kickbacks for talking about this course but I do lo would love an identifier and like if you can make a promo code Ashley because if we get x amount of Ashley's on the next um, course, Rob, mm -hmm. that means that you do have to come to Napa for our retreat. 
Like, so let's bring Ritter and Ramsey to Napa, guys, and have them speak. They're going to talk about mindset, case acceptance. It's going to be a blast. And I don't know if you know how, ex I mean, you can tell how excited I am talking about the protocol. It is everything and then some. And so it is the shortcut to greatness. Don't wait 20 years in practice. Do this now. I did it because I'm setting up my second location and all the ways that I want to be practicing for the next, you know, 20 years. So, um, so let's, let's bring you guys to Napa. Take let's, the course. Okay. So let's do, um, if anybody from your pod and your group Come, calls to register. And by the way, you want to go to theprotocollive.com. So it's www.theprotocollive.com. And there's contact information in there to contact our Ashley to sign up. What should they say? Not just that they heard you from your um, from the pod, but from your group. I want to give them like a code so we know. What, what code should it be? Should it be? Let's, um, let's have the code NAPA. NAPA. Okay. Yeah. And if Napa? we get X amount of Napa's, then then it's a mandatory attendance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. You know, it's so hard to say no to going to hmm, Napa in the fall. It's, it's like the best, the best time. Oh, of course it is. It's the it's like one of the ideal, you know, adult adulting weekends, right? Oh, it's yeah. It's amongst friends with information and drinking wine in a beautiful place with small great, group setting. Small group setting, organic food. Jeez, well, who wouldn't want to go to something like that? I, I don't know. But um yeah, let's do that. Have them when you register, just say Napa and we'll know that you're part of the group. Yeah. And um uh if there's anything else I can do, you can follow me on Insta if you don't. It's Dr. Rob Ritter, D R R O B R I T T R. DM me. I get a lot of DMs um, from that and uh, answer as many questions as I possibly can. Yes. Thank you again for joining us this morning or this afternoon where you're at in Florida. And we have just barely scratched the surface, guys. If you haven't already listened to the way he communicates, like, you and Chris, you guys are so masterful in your words and your energy and um, and you're so passionate about what you're teaching. It just is a natural flow. It's like communicating with friends and I can't implore you enough. Go sign up for the course. Mention Napa. Like I said, I get no monetary kickbacks. I just really want our profession to benefit from your knowledge and expertise and it's going to be a win-win-win like and we get to have you guys in napa <laughs> you're very kind ashley great spending time with you you as well and have a wonderful weekend and thank you guys again for listening to another episode of the making of make sure to please reach out to dr rob ritter sign up for the protocol live.com mention napa and um, you will not regret it. And then message me and let me know that you're taking the course because now I can bounce ideas back and forth between us. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I have a feeling that like good things are brewing. So um, cheers guys, cheers to the weekend. Thank you.